hydroxychloroquine, what actually is it? Does it cure COVID? And how and why or why not? How do we prove it? Or how do we prove that it doesn't work if it doesn't work? And do we really need to? Because it's an emergency. It's a pandemic. We don't have time to do all of the normal trials, do we? Surely anything is better than nothing. Well, yes and no. Ah, not a bear in sight. The bear patrol must be working like a charm. That's specious reasoning, Dad. Thank you, honey. By your logic, I could claim that this rock keeps tigers away. Oh, how does it work? It doesn't work. Uh-huh. It's just a stupid rock. Uh-huh. But I don't see any tigers around here, do you? Lisa, I want to buy your rock. I recently made a video about the side effects of hydroxychloroquine. If you haven't seen it, it might be worth taking a look at, but essentially it's just saying about some of the side effects that hydroxychloroquine can have, because it's not completely side effect free. Generally speaking, it is a very safe drug. It's worth saying about the difference between hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine. They're essentially the same thing, but hydroxychloroquine has an extra few atoms on it, the hydroxy group, and that actually does reduce the side effects. So generally speaking, it's a very safe drug. But... It's not that uncommon to get some mild side effects, and sometimes people can get serious side effects from it, which occasionally can be life-threatening. And the more people that take hydroxychloroquine, the more people will get some side effects from it, and more of those will be serious side effects. The point is just that if you don't need it, it's not good to take it. Something isn't always better than nothing if the something can be poisonous. Having said that, if it works, we want to know about it, and the benefit can certainly outweigh those side effects if you need it. So how do we find out? First things first, where does all this come from? Hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine are anti-malarial drugs that have been used since the 40s for malaria. They're on the WHO list of essential medicines because they are effective for malaria. There is some resistance, but that's another story. They're also sometimes used for some rheumatological conditions, for example, SLE or sometimes rheumatoid arthritis. Now, I think it's interesting to think about why they're used for rheumatological conditions, because essentially chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine can dampen down your immune system, and that's why they work for rheumatological conditions, so rheumatoid arthritis and SLE, for example, are autoimmune conditions. What that means is your immune system starts to target your own body. It falsely recognises parts of your own body as something that it needs to be fighting off. Chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine work by reducing that immune response. Essentially, they reduce antigen presentation. Antigens are the bits of chemicals which are presented to your immune system for your immune system to attack. So, for example, in an autoimmune condition, the antigen would be the bit of your own body for your immune system to attack. In a viral infection, it's the part of your virus which your immune system recognises. Chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine also reduce the inflammatory response more generally, so they do help with those autoimmune conditions. Now, this is a really good example of how a little bit of knowledge can kind of help to stimulate thought, but really doesn't get you anywhere. Because surely, if it reduces your immune response, then that's not going to be good for fighting off an infection. If your body doesn't recognise the antigens from the virus, Virus, you might not be able to fight it off properly, and then it could be even worse. You need that immune response, surely. But maybe if severe cases could be because your body's partly going into an inflammatory overdrive, maybe reducing those inflammatory markers, reducing that inflammation, might help to reduce the severity of those severe cases. Or maybe you don't really know. You can kind of argue yourself around in circles and just by theorising about things, it doesn't really get you anywhere. So what you need to do is you need to go and find out. You can use those thoughts as a starting point but you need to break it down a little bit further. So you start with lab experiments. You look at how the virus and how infected cells respond to the drug in lab conditions. And there were some experiments done that showed that chloroquine reduced viral entry into cells and viral replication in cells. Brilliant. Sounds great. Roll out the red carpet, right? Well, no. Yes, maybe. Roll out the red carpet enough to move on to the next step. It certainly gives you something to work with. It certainly gives you something to look at and work from. There's promise there, but that doesn't mean that it gets rid of the disease in people. 
So you start your trials in people, and there were a couple of small ones that were done that suggested that hydroxychloroquine would be helpful for COVID, and that's what started this whole thing off. But the devil's in the detail. So the small French study did show that hydroxychloroquine was helpful to reduce your viral load. Brilliant. But when you dig a little bit deeper, one, it was very small. Small studies are useful as a little bit of a guide, but sometimes they can lack the power that they need. But there was one massive, massive, huge, gaping hole in this study, which essentially makes it completely useless, which is that the people that started taking hydroxychloroquine and had to stop it were not included in the results. It was only the people that completed the course of hydroxychloroquine that were included in the results. Now, you might think that that's perfectly okay and that that's helpful because it tells us what happens if you finish taking the course of hydroxychloroquine. Well, yeah, maybe, but the problem was that there were people in the study that were excluded because they started taking hydroxychloroquine and then got more poorly and they had to go to ICU or they died. So, so we're looking at a trial of a treatment to test whether it's effective in saving people's lives, but we're only looking at the data from the people whose lives were saved. So it's nonsense. So it's a rubbish study and essentially doesn't really mean anything, but it does give you something to think, well, maybe there's something in it, we need to look more at it. So what's happened since? There's been another small French study that basically showed the opposite, that hydroxychloroquine actually made outcomes worse which might fit with the other one if you included the people that were excluded because they were more poorly. There's been a couple of trials to come out of China that have showed mixed results. There's not a lot to go on for certain though. So the point is, hydroxychloroquine might help. It's certainly not a wonder cure. It might make things worse. There are some ongoing trials bigger, randomised, blinded trials going on in the UK and the US and other countries, and the Cochrane Collaboration, who are the big international collaboration that do big multi-centre studies and pull together different studies in order to make the best evidence in the world, basically. They're keeping an eye on all these studies to get the results of them and pull them together as soon as we possibly can do. Because that's the thing, we need to do it as soon as we possibly can do. It's a pandemic, it's an emergency. But that doesn't mean that we need to jump to say, well, something is better than nothing, because sometimes nothing is better than a poison, and we don't know whether hydroxychloroquine works. It might do, but it might make things worse, and it does come with side effects for some people, so we don't know yet something isn't always better than nothing. And that's before we even think about prophylaxis. There isn't any evidence whatsoever about whether it works as a prophylactic as to whether taking it to stop you getting COVID works. We don't know. And that's just on an individual level. When you scale it up to a public health, to a policy level, then you've got even more problems because obviously there's a lot of resource investment. It costs a lot of money to make drugs on that scale. And if they work and they're helpful, yeah, you need to be putting that money in there, but if they're not, then you might be better off putting it elsewhere because, sadly, we don't have infinite resources. And until you scale up that supply, there's still only a certain amount of that drug available and people need it for malaria treatment or for arthritis. If you've got arthritis and you need hydroxychloroquine to help with that, and then other people are panic buying it because it may or may not work for COVID, it's the medical equivalent of panic buying toilet paper, isn't it? And the consequences of not having enough toilet paper are not ideal. But the consequences of not having your arthritis drug, I mean, it's much worse. That's the end. Like, comment, subscribe, share the links, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>